Robert Young Pelton looks like anyone else. A married man with a wife, two daughters, a dog, and a home in a suburb of Los Angeles. But Pelton's not like the rest of us. Today, he's telling his wife and daughters that he's decided to take yet another hazardous journey. His mission, to find this man, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the legendary lion of Panjshir who helped drive the Soviets from Afghanistan. Now, the leader of the resistance against the feared Taliban regime. To update his definitive guide to the world's war zones, Pelton feels compelled to understand what makes this living legend tick and to explore his war-ravaged world. To make it there alive, he'll have to dodge rocket fire, cross borders without a passport, and trespass into war zones. His wife and daughters understand. It's what he lives for. Because Robert Young Pelton has devoted his life to traveling to the world's most dangerous places. Afghanistan, an unforgiving land controlled by the feared Taliban regime, a refuge for international terrorists, including Osama bin Laden. Under Taliban rule, women have lost their jobs and their right to be educated. The crime of theft is punishable by amputation movies, dancing, book reading, magazines, and videos are strictly forbidden. This country has more guns per person than anywhere else on Earth. It's a nation with its finger on the trigger. Afghanistan is a very dangerous place. Robert Young Pelton's kind of place. Landy Kotler, right? Yeah, and we're across in... the border into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see how far we get before the Taliban spank us and send us home. Having talked his way across the border without a visa, something he's done dozens of times before, Pelton arrives in Kabul, capital of Afghanistan. Here, he will begin his quest to reach the resistance leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud. <laughs> In 1979, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan to support a puppet communist dictator. Massoud helped lead the Islamic guerrillas who fought back so fiercely, they turned it into the Soviets' Vietnam. A brilliant strategist, he helped assure the Afghan victory. After chasing out the Soviets, Massoud battled his rivals for control of Kabul, reducing the city to rubble. Now, Massoud has withdrawn to the north, leaving the city under strict Taliban control. Deadly reminders of the struggle with Massoud lurk everywhere. Over 12 million explosive mines planted over the last two decades of warfare. In fact, Afghanistan has more mines than people.
After learning about the UN's demining efforts, Pelton hopes they will help him cross the Taliban front lines to meet the Taliban's mortal enemy, Massoud, leading the resistance in the north. First, if he is to survive in the most heavily mined nation on Earth, he will have to learn the grim facts of life about lethal explosives. Lacking sophisticated equipment to locate mines, the Afghans rely on one of nature's most sensitive detection devices. I'm in Pinefield, just east of Jalalabad, and we're out here with MDC, seeing how they de clear minefields with the dog. This is a Malinois, this is a young one. And he's learning how to snip for mines and help clear fields. Pelton gets a rare look at the restricted area where unexploded mines are taken for disposal. At the current rate of disposal, it will take 20,000 years to destroy them all. The explosion sparks a desperate race. For these children, the few pennies earned from selling scraps of copper or brass can spell the difference between starvation and survival. These folks are now digging for a scrap. As you can see, they're fighting over bits and pieces, and one guy was whacking somebody else with a shovel. That's not the prettiest thing in terms of the economic condition of Afghanistan. Surveying Kabul's ruins, Pelton learns the situation is considered too precarious for the demining agency to take him to the front lines. He wangles a press pass from the Taliban government. His goal, to cross the Taliban lines and reach Massoud's forces. So we're heading off to meet the commander now. It's a short walk to the Taliban front lines. The Taliban fighters believe they will go straight to heaven if they die in a holy war. One asks Pelton, if you did not come here to die, then why are you here? I'm not trying to be theatrical here because I'm hunched down because they just loosed off a few artillery shells at us, but uh, we'd be prime fodder for a sniper if they had somebody up on the hills around here. But we can see the, the enemy positions through this captured Russian uh, pair of binoculars. And as you can see, there's a plane in front of us and then the mountains behind us. With meager equipment, the Taliban are forced to improvise. A heap of stones serves as a makeshift rocket launcher. Even here, a devout Muslim chants the call to prayer. It was kind of interesting, though, when we heard the man up here calling for prayer, and he waited till he was finished calling for prayer before he fired the tank shell. It's time to head back on a trail where death lies hidden underfoot. This is an active minefield with all sorts of unexplored ordnance. So we're sticking to the path here, like they teach the kids in school. No, 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 no. Okay, this man is showing us a mine. No, 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 okay. He's got the fuse off it. Okay, he's defused it. Okay. <laughs> That's why God invented telephoto lenses, I'll tell you. After making it across the minefield, Pelton is grateful for a cup of tea with Talib commanders. I'm concerned about hospitality, so they want us to share some hospitality and some tea with them. The tea's good, eh? But when he tells them of his plan to cross over to Massoud's side, they have bad news. 
They explained it would mean crossing a thousand meters through an active fire zone. Not just risky, suicidal. So close to my goal of reaching Masud, I was forced to turn back. Robert Young Pelton's goal seems unattainable to everyone but Pelton himself. It will be a year before Pelton can organize his second attempt to reach Masood. Driven by his determination to meet the charismatic leader, this time he makes a bold decision. With Masood's hard-pressed forces retreating to the north, Pelton will enter Afghanistan through the dangerous back door across the rugged Pamir Mountains, a risky shortcut to his goal, and he will do it alone. From Uzbekistan, with a combination of luck and chutzpah, he bluffs his way into neighboring Tajikistan. Pelton hitches a ride for over 100 miles across the rugged Pamir Mountains, trying to reach the city of Dushanbe. There, he hopes to catch a train to Termiz on the Afghan border. Crossing a rickety bridge, Pelton makes an unnerving discovery. This is where the locals come to scavenge firewood. The weather in the high mountain passes is notoriously treacherous. Storm clouds descend, and the temperature plummets. Pelton finds himself trapped in a blizzard. As the sun sets at 12,000 feet in the Pamir Mountains, on the coldest night of Pelton's life, he'll focus less on reaching Masood than on surviving until dawn. Next, Pelton risks a chopper flight through a hazardous no-fly zone on the world's most dangerous places. You're watching the world's most dangerous places on the Travel Channel. Somewhere high in the forbidding Pamir Mountains of Tajikistan. Altitude, 12,000 feet. Temperature, 10 below zero. Tajikistan, my good friend Hamrakul. You can see out there, the most beautiful place in the world to get stranded for a night. Yeah. Unless, of course, you're freezing to death. It's about 6.30 in the morning. These are other folks that have been stuck, although they made it up to the top. While some turn back, Pelton presses on. After hiking 10 miles, he hitches a ride on a potato truck. At Dushan Bay, a train has arrived packed with refugees from the Taliban war against Masood. Without a ticket or visa, Pelton stows aboard for its trip back to Afghanistan. He's in alien territory, but without knowing a word of Russian, somehow Pelton speaks their language. 
When the train arrives at the border town of Termiz, he finds he's too late. The Taliban have sealed off the border to Afghanistan. No one can cross. Pelton has a grim choice. Leave now or wind up in prison. Within a mile of the Afghan border, closer than I had ever come to reaching Masud, I had to turn back. Twice I'd tried to reach the man and failed, but I didn't give up. Six months later, Robert Young Pelton sets out on a secret route to reach Ahmad Shah Massoud. His two failures have only whetted his appetite for a third go for broke attempt. This time, he has an ambitious new plan. Again, he will attempt to enter Afghanistan the back way through the former Soviet republics. But he has learned he can't do it alone. He needs the right connections. So, along with filmmaker David Keane, he has enlisted Peter Juvenal. Peter is a veteran war cameraman who has known Massoud since 1985. Covering the Afghan-Soviet war, Peter secretly entered Afghanistan on foot 72 times. At the Tashkent airport, as arranged, their driver is waiting. He is to take them from Uzbekistan across the border to Tajikistan. Can we cross the border without a visa? Okay. You have Uzbek visa? Yeah. yeah. No problem. The two most dangerous words in travel. No problem. For Pelton, no problem turns into a big problem because suddenly, when he tries to cross the border into Tajikistan, the officials refuse entry. So what's the, what's the $10 for? It's for bakshish, bakshish. Bakshish, why? Bakshish, international slang for bribe. Quickly, the $10 escalates into 100 As part of the deal, they must leave their own driver behind and take a driver designated by the corrupt official. They cross a no man's land of a hundred yards where desperate refugees wait to enter Uzbekistan. So this is Tajikistan here? At the checkpoint on the Tajikistan side, they also want bribes. Peter is the only one who knows enough Russian to negotiate. At first, it's touch and go. With a hidden camera, they film the age-old ritual of bribery. The Tajik guards are not as forgiving as the Uzbeks. If Pelton and his friends are caught filming, they will be thrown in jail or shot as spies. $16 in my passport uh -huh. and then gave it with the, another passport to one of the customs officials. Took me into a little side room and uh, put the $100 bill in his pocket and then kept the 16 I guess, for his mates and said, that would do nicely, thanks. <laughs> and then shook my hands so everybody could see. I guess that was a signal. And uh, we went. <laughs> At last, entering Tajikistan, they reached the town of Dushan Bay. There, they meet up with their key contact, a mysterious figure known by the alias of General Muslim. Muslim is Masood's contact man in Dushan Bay, a formidable warrior whom Peter covered fighting the Soviets. He says he'll try to get them visas into Afghanistan. Okay, so I'll give you 400 for everybody. And then get the most visa for the money. So if you can get the same price, you can get double entry. General Muslim pulls the right strings. They get their visas. At the hotel, they meet up with their interpreter, Hanif, 
a master of five languages. Suddenly, they get word. They are to leave on a secret flight that officially does not exist. In this shadowy world, these clandestine flights are the lifeline of Masood's beleaguered forces, bringing desperately needed arms and ammunition. The day of departure, they see a colorful graduation festival. For Pelton, it holds a deeper meaning. The women smiling in public, the music, the dancing, are all reminders of what he will be leaving behind when he enters Afghanistan. We're about to board a Russian helicopter for a fairly hair-raising flight into Talakan. And the reason people are taking pictures is probably the last remembrance they'll have of their friends. Bunch of wives. Oh, excuse me, thank you very much. The passengers are tense, for good reason. A few days ago, on this same flight, Taliban MiGs tried to shoot this chopper down. At last, they land at Talakan, less than 10 miles from the front lines with the Taliban. Talakan right now, which is the main supply base for the Northern Alliance. We're a little deaf from flying in an old that? Russian helicopter. Talakan, an isolated enclave where Masood has come to make his last stand. Few outsiders have ever set foot here. It seems as if Pelton's goal of meeting Masood is at last within his grasp. Coming up, Pelton runs the gauntlet to escape Taliban tank fire on the world's most dangerous places. You're watching the world's most dangerous places on the Travel Channel. Talakan, in the war-torn north of Afghanistan. Beneath its picturesque surface, Talakan is one of the world's most dangerous places, a last stronghold for resistance against the Taliban. Command post of the legendary warrior Ahmad Shah Massoud the man Robert Young Pelton has risked his life to meet. Signs of war appear in unexpected places. In the market, along with the fruits and vegetables, are bomb fragments for sale. This is from a cluster bomb. It holds the cluster bombs into the bomb, and then the little bomblets. This scrap aluminum from bombs might be hammered into something as harmless as a teapot. Nearby, Masood's men kill time, watching traditional Afghan wrestling. They bet on the fighters, amateurs from among their ranks. Still more young men pour down from the farm country in the hills to join Massoud's forces. They have experienced the Taliban's harsh, scorched earth rule and want to fight back. This is a uh, training camp for new recruits for the Northern Alliance. Many are barefoot and without guns. 
But they have come to follow Massoud into battle, to defend their homes from the Taliban onslaught. Seeing the devotion of Massoud's men only increases Pelton's resolve to meet him. He confers with Massoud's commanders to try to arrange it. The commanders say Massoud wants Pelton to visit his men on the front lines before he will meet with him. A test, perhaps, of Pelton's commitment. His escort will be Commander Daoud, himself a legendary fighter against the Taliban. The fighting broke out, took place in this area. We call this the graveyard of the Taliban. Commander Daoud accompanies Pelton to visit Massoud's men on the front lines. To avoid the threat of Taliban tank fire, they leave the main road. After a short drive, fearing the dust plume from their jeep will attract tank fire, they set out on foot. Pelton discovers life on the front lines is an austere routine of waiting. No smoking, and in keeping with strict Muslim belief, no alcohol. All pictures of women are also forbidden. Here at any moment, the monotony of waiting can explode into violence, as recorded in this rear combat footage of Massoud's men. sunset. Time for Pelton to leave the front lines. But a Taliban tank has zeroed in on their position. They'll have to run the gauntlet. Unfortunately, their driver goes so slowly, they suspect he's under the influence of hashish, a widely used local drug. So is it wise to slow down and look over your shoulder uh, in case? I really wish you'd let it rip. I'm like... Pelton takes over and lets it rip. Peter thinks he's pulled over too soon, that they're still in harm's way. Robert stopped in the worst place. In the front. You stopped, you stopped in the worst place. It's where they just, those two rounds landed in the service. Yeah, it's okay. Now we're in the worst place. With the worst driver. Okay. All right, that's good. Even out of tank range, driving here is its own test of raw bravado. As Pelton returns to Talakan, he is about to learn that in one of the world's most dangerous places, nowhere is safe. Next, Pelton discovers the deadly secrets of a Russian-made tank on the world's most dangerous places.
You're watching the world's most dangerous places on the Travel Channel. 7.30 a.m. At the guest house in the remote Afghan town of Talakan, <laughs> Pelton wakes up to a peaceful morning. A few blocks away, for one family, it will be their last. So what happened to you? Yeah, yeah, you see? They've just dropped two 500 pound bombs in the area where the hospital and the high school was that we visited yesterday. At the hospital, the grim wait for victims begins. They do not have to wait long. A distraught father brings in his daughter, one of the survivors. At a moment like this, I couldn't help thinking of my own daughters. Seeing children in war, it's, it's something you never get used to. You can see the impact of a 500 pound bomb. It just landed in this courtyard in this compound. It snapped all the trees off, killed the birds in the trees. And all the livestock in the yard here, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is the people that get killed sitting having breakfast. This is what a 500 pound bomb does when it's dropped in the center of a home. It's not usually the bomb that kills, it's the blast and the shrapnel. In this case, it was probably the blast. I'm standing in a hole that's at least 12 feet deep. 10 people were living in this house. Is this the house here or is that the house? Like, there was a house here. There was a house here. So were people injured here? There was a house here. There was a house here. Okay. While Pelton is interviewing blast victims, he receives word from Massoud's commanders. They want Pelton to journey south to the Panjshir Valley. Are they moving him there to meet with Massoud, or to prove himself once more by plunging him deep into Massoud's world? Expected pleasure to be uh, getting on board a helicopter for the Panjshir because we planned to spend two days in the back of a truck, hopefully crossing a river that was flooded right now. And uh, this isn't the safest or the most enjoyable way to travel, but it's probably better than spending two days traveling along the front lines to get to the south. Pelton has an ominous traveling companion, the coffin of a fighter recently killed in action. And under the coffin, there's a heavy load of ammunition. The chopper is dangerously overloaded. For precarious seconds, it hurtles down the runway, struggling to lift off. In search of Masood, Pelton will ride over an hour south into the Panjshir Valley, where bitter fighting has raged for decades. Now we finally made it to the Panjshir. This is Rokas. And, uh, this is their headquarters in the Panjshir. In a place where few outsiders have ever set foot, Peter is welcomed by his old buddies from the war against the Soviets. Hoping to find Masood, they hurry to his compound, the mountain stronghold where he grew up. Pelton discovers that Masood is not there. Once again, his hosts have him playing a frustrating game. 
but the sudden chance to visit the front lines nearby offers a rare opportunity. I wanted to meet the guys who were shooting at me a year before, when I was with the Taliban. To reach the front lines, they must drive south for a day, deep into the Panjshir Valley, an ancient battlefield that invaders from Alexander the Great to the Soviets failed to conquer. Here, Massoud won his greatest victories against the Soviets. The landscape is littered with rusty relics of those fierce battles, where over 14,000 Soviets died. After a day of driving, Pelton reaches Massoud's front lines at Cherikar, not far from Kabul. Peter worries that they'll make an easy target. You shouldn't go to the front line with a right there. I mean, this is what you shouldn't do. Oh, thank you, Peter. Okay, so far we've broken every rule of luck. So we're driving a bright red pickup truck, and we're the only vehicle on the road, and we're probably the first vehicle, and we've just gone past where the tanks are. But we're with the commander, so he's got a few years on him, so maybe, maybe there's some luck there. In the combat zone, Pelton and Peter take a rare look inside a combat-ready Russian-made tank. <laughs> you know, I'm stuck. Yeah, you sit there, you put your foot down here. Yeah. Okay, okay here we go. I got my binoculars here. Oh, yeah, baby. And then I've got my main gunner. Up, down. It's in Russian, too, huh? Where are the turrets turning. All right, that's the degree. That's in case the electronics get knocked out. And the noise, you know, you've got a lot of noise in here. Your vision is very limited, through, seeing through those. And you imagine there's no air conditioning. There's no, breathe, no windows. There's a little side right here. If it hits that ammunition, the top pops off. Just like that. Just like that. God, what a miserable way to fight a war. Whoa! Pelton arrives at the last desolate outpost on the extreme front lines. In this bleak no man's land, Massoud's forces are locked in a stalemate with the Taliban. A futile struggle yielding neither victory nor defeat. These were the very men who had been shooting at me when I was with the Taliban. I, I couldn't help thinking I had befriended men on both sides, men fighting for Massoud and men fighting for the Talibs. But if I had tried to walk across the ground separating them, they would have shot me dead. Back at Massoud's compound, Pelton waits in vain for a chopper to take them to Talakan. They have heard horror stories of people being stranded here for months. It will be five long days until a chopper shows up, with orders for Pelton to return to Talakan at once. Pelton is confident that his time has come to meet Massoud at last. Coming up, Pelton enters the anguished world of an Afghan prison on the world's most dangerous places. You're watching the world's most dangerous places on the Travel Channel. 
Talakan, a remote base in northern Afghanistan. With his visa running out, Robert Young Pelton still awaits his chance to meet Ahmad Shah Massoud. Then there's an unexpected turn of events. Pelton is taken to a car and driven out of the city for four hours, his destination unknown. Masood wanted me to visit a prison. Maybe this was the last part of his test. In a strange way, it made sense. Thomas Jefferson once said, if you want to really understand the country, see its prisons. Masood's commanders want Pelton to see Pakistani prisoners captured fighting for the Taliban, supposed proof of Pakistani interference in the conflict. But Pelton finds no Pakistani officers, only unfortunate souls who wound up here in a pathetic twist of fate. Behind the prison walls, some battle loneliness and despair to cling to their sanity. Others have already lost that battle. Of all the dangerous places on earth, perhaps the most dangerous is the human mind. At last, the news comes that Pelton has been waiting for. After a four-day wait, sitting in the guest house, uh, we're being taken to an undisclosed location for an interview with Masur. And everything here is kind of up in the air or not defined, for, mostly for security reasons. After an arduous three-year quest, Pelton meets Masood at last. In the flesh, this bigger-than-life figure is grayer and more battle-weary than Pelton had expected. Personal point of view, does he have the same enthusiasm, the same uh, confidence that he had when he was younger as he does now? Nobody likes war and fighting, especially not in his own country. If he was incapacitated, who would take over his role against the Taliban? Our resistance doesn't belong to one person. It belongs to the nation and the people of Afghanistan. If one day I am not here, someone will take over the command and resist. Even if only one of us is left, we will fight. After the interview, Pelton feels he has met a kindred spirit, a man who doesn't give up. For Pelton, even after meeting him, Ahmad Shah Massoud remains an elusive figure, trapped in his role in history. A warrior worn down by decades of conflict, deadlocked in a struggle no one can win. And yet, in his independence and courage, he stands as a symbol of Afghanistan's spirit of resistance. Robert Young Pelton's three-year-long quest has ended. Was it worth the ordeal? Meeting Masood, I felt I was a witness to history. When I travel to the world's most dangerous places, I see the best and the worst in people. And I see it with my own eyes. There's a purity in that, seeing life for yourself, unfiltered by other people's judgments. 
And at journey's end, I'm never really the same person I was at the beginning. But maybe that's the biggest discovery of all. <laughs> 